Welcome to the Level Design Podcast. In this episode, we talk to Valentina Chrysostomo about Gone Home, Red Dead Redemption 2, and making games in PowerPoint. Let's get on with the show. Welcome, Jonathan. Welcome, Rob. I'm here with my usual awesome co-host, Jonathan Wilson, from Hangar 17. 13. Thirteen. Uh, <laughs> not quite. See, Rob knows. No, I'll Rob's try, I'll try. Right. Well, you, that's you that's, that's City Bryce, Seventeen man. you're thinking of, which is a far oh, yeah. darker place. <laughs> Team Seventeen. One's worms and the other ones. One's, one's, yeah. ma- one's mafia. Yeah, mafia worms. There's a concept. Yeah, it's Monday. We're recording on a Monday. I've only had two cups of coffee today. I am running very low. Joining us is a very, very special guest. Is Valentina Chrysostomu from Red Dead Redemption to GTA Five, the ghost chasing dead end job. And a new title called Everywhere. Welcome, Valentina. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That's one hell of a CV to to carry around. Yeah. If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we do say so indeed. Thank I, you very much. So thank you so much for coming on the show. These are such awesome games. I, I remember seeing a Dead End Job, for one, that, that looked awesome. That's by uh, Ant Workshop, right? Yes, that's true. Yeah, this... Um indie game company here in Edinburgh run by my my very good friend Tony Gowland who Duh. I worked with Tony's in, awesome <laughs> in 2001 I first worked with Tony Gowland so 19 years ago oh wow 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 so Valentina with that CV you got to tell us kind of a little bit of background how you got into this this industry hmm I'm not sure where to start actually I, th- I think it all begins with playing games I guess and being extremely passionate about them but Never had the chance to follow my dreams properly. But then I played a few games in 2013 that changed my mind. And uh, I really pushed me to kind of hone my skills and find out what is game development and get into it. That was The Last of Us, Gone Home and Bioshock Infinite. Oh, wow. They're all different games, which is yeah. uh, it's very weird. What was connecting them, I think, was the how they told their stories. And mm. all their stories impacted me in a different way. Uh, so much so that I actually contacted Steve Gaynor, who uh, was the founder of Fulbright that made Gone Home. And I was like, I really like your game. I want to make games just because he made that. And I think I can do it. Um, and he actually helped me out. We exchanged emails um, a few times after that. And we kept in touch until now and everything. And wow. it's That's been, awesome. yeah, he, he encouraged me and I pursued so I was studying education at the time actually is something completely different so uh, after being encouraged I was like okay I I need to get into games and I found uh, a master's degree in design and um, development of computer games so I did that and after doing that and while doing that I worked on some personal projects to build up a portfolio and because I knew there was the only way I could get into the industry was having kind of like a solid little portfolio. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't know, I'm, I'm from Cyprus, so it's very hard to find uh, a gaming job in Cyprus uh, and or, or to travel anywhere else. So I thought like, yeah, I need a good portfolio for that. Yeah. And after that, I started looking for jobs uh, outside of uh, my home country. And the first company that hired me was Rockstar as a QA tester on GTA V. Um, that's how it started. After that, I worked a bit on GTA Five as a test, uh, QA tester, and then I moved on to Red Dead Redemption Two as an open world designer. Once that period was done in my life, I I worked at an indie company called Ant Workshop, and I worked on that and job, and we released that. And basically, that's kind of my journey so far. Wow, it's a great journey. I've got to say that Gone Home was, I think, the game that also made me think. I, I might be able to do this. Yeah. And I don't mean in a, in, a, in any negative, not that it's a simple game, not that it's, it's... It's a game that you can say, I can tell a story dynamically. That and Dear Esther were two games that I thought, well, I can actually maybe get into game development. Yeah. I think they proved that in order to make a great game, it doesn't have to be a AAA blockbuster that breaks all the records and is super extremely complex to make. It's something that you could play for two hours and it was just like, wow, mind-blowing. And you could understand a little bit how it was made without freaking out. And I think that that kind of small step, being able to relate to it, is kind of what helped me definitely get into gaming. That is 
what design is about is being able to see under the covers and going like okay so like in a triple a game the covers are pretty deep right there's mechanics that mm -hmm. that I can hold in my brain like two steps, but then there's a third step that, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if I'm explaining myself <laughs> right. You know, you go like, okay, yeah, if I shoot the thing, the thing blows up, but then how do you keep scores of all these different AIs coming towards me? I don't know. Just <laughs> way beyond my, my capability as a single human being. You don't need hundreds of systems to do. I think that's what Gone Home kind of proves. Uh, it told a really powerful story uh, without, and it was every like a good successful game by those stretches, but it didn't have millions of systems building on top of each other in order to do it, which I think is speaking to kind of why you found it and looked mm -hmm. at you. I can tell a story with a character controller and interacts. Yeah. Like, I, there's a few more things going on there, but like, if you strip it down to brass tacks, like, it is your character controller is the main embodiment. Whereas in other AAA games, there's the character controller, the scoring system, the leveling yeah. up, the ranking, all the weapons, and then that's when you kind of, your head just explodes trying to think mm -hmm. about it all. And, and it also can hit you in the feels, right? That's the, that's the other thing. Is it was like a lot of the game is happening in my head rather than happening on the screen. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. I, I guess it's. I, f I found it really interesting that they, they decided to strip out so much of what was conventionally a game at that time. Obviously, you had things like uh, Dear Esther as well that were around at that time. But it, it was one of the first projects where a team of experienced developers took a step back and thought about how maybe a substantial portion of the players were actually playing games. That they were in there for the experience mm -hmm. of the sort of atmosphere of the world and not necessarily so much about... The gameplay systems like john was talking about about the yeah. about the, the complicated yeah. interplay of all these systems but more about the, the the sort of essential experience of playing a new exploring a new world as much as those systems like in bigger games are important there's like there's always the fact that they can get in the way as well like you have a story you want to tell but sometimes just because of all the systems you have working away in the background they do get in the way of you delivering the actual core narrative that you want to do so I think yeah. it was impressive for that for Fulbright to take that step back and be like, no, let's strip it back to brass tacks and put the emphasis on the narrative, put it on the atmosphere. In all fairness, put it on the level, right? It was yeah, the house. The house. It was all yeah. about the house. <laughs> the house is really incredible, to be honest. Like yeah. the way it was built and the way uh, the the way you could play it. It you yeah. could go kinda everywhere. But at the same time, I think a lot of people follow the same path, which is kind of impressive for a, a level, right? Because mm -hmm. if yeah. you can get a lot of people to follow the same path, there must be like this few tricks that the people behind it knew. They knew how to place things or how to light things or how to where to lock the doors yeah. and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff that led you towards a specific direction and, and made it more interesting. I think that's one of the strengths you get from, like we said before, but they focus on the atmosphere with this, which means it's all about the environment. It's like they can go down to that like nth degree on lighting or careful placement of something just to subtly grab the player's attention. But there wasn't loads of markers or anything scattering your screen. Like you were just walking around this house free to explore yeah and it was it was quite revolutionary in the way that it it took a very very familiar place obviously because it wasn't it wasn't a spaceship mm -hmm. it wasn't somewhere yeah. that many you know it was a suburban house that was instantly familiar with a whole generation of players and all the things in it were instantly familiar so people went in it and explored it as they would a normal house so it was a kind of very ob logical progression wasn't it that game has got some really interesting tricks but also what what I kind of learned by a whole bunch of GDC talks and 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 uh, I got a bit fascinated by this game, by the way. So please excuse me if I go the wrong. You might, you can tell me to shut up and we'll edit all of this out. But it's fine. <laughs> we we all did at yeah. one point. It, it just seemed to me like you as you progress through the house, you see I was going to say better but more complex level design. You start out with mm -hmm. really simple level design, which is a corridor that turns right, and that. You know, it's kind of like, okay, we're just learning level design. By the time you get to the second floor, you're now You've getting... Very complicated rooms, like the library is a very complicated room. Right. It's mm -hmm. interesting you say that by the time you get to the second room because the second floor is accessible from the get-go. It's straight like ahead right. once you open the door. But why don't we go there first? It's like, that's a cool thing, right? Yeah, yeah. that's a real level design question. Why don't we go Yeah, there? exactly. That's the perfect level design question. It's like... That's how they, that game was built. Mm. The people knew how to like design it exactly to lead you where they wanted. I'm pretty sure people went on the second floor too, but it's more like 
for some reason, go into the left where the dark corridor is and there's a flashing light draws you a little bit more than going up a floor where there may be like a lot more other rooms to explore. That's kind of like sounds overwhelming already. Yeah, but it's also like a massive welcoming staircase, right? You come in and you look at yeah. the staircase, but you say, like, nope. nope, I'm going to go to the left. <laughs> it's something about how like how maybe we have to learn from how, how rats follow mazes, how maybe people just explore houses in a certain way. Because it felt like you were coming into someone's private space and it was i almost felt like i was being respectful by sort of like tentatively working around yeah i know right you're not going to go straight to the bedroom right yeah exactly and also i certainly from the kind of the atmosphere that was brought forward with the with the storm and the darkness i certainly i Mm -hmm. certainly felt a little bit scared about yeah. going up the stairs i didn't quite yeah. know what i uh-huh. might find up there so yeah. i was like i'm gonna keep my back to the wall and just inch yeah. around the side <laughs> the atmosphere makes you feel uneasy when you first go in like rob's saying he felt scared it's like this wasn't like this isn't a horror mm. game yeah but it has the it has the it has a very clearly defined atmosphere that gives the sense that it is one and like that's why rob said oh, i'm going to keep my back to the wall i'm going to go up to the areas of light because safety you're going to think that's taking you to safety mm-hmm. but when did you realize it wasn't a horror game like oh, very, i didn't know very very, very oh, late not, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so i think i got very far far through it before i was like oh hmm. nothing's actually coming to get me or i haven't had it yeah it's like i haven't had a jump scare or anything throughout this i've been i've been anticipating one i've been expecting something else to come and get me but it just never happens. Like, I think it never that's drops. that's what el- what else is great about it is is that well when I first bought it I didn't even know what it was about to be honest I I just saw the art and I'm like yeah that looks cool and um, I started playing it and I thought it was kind of like a supernatural maybe like horror or something because of the atmosphere so I did I was kind of expecting something to happen especially throughout the game there was like this um, game that the um, people in the house played with the Ouija board, I think, or they were chasing some sort of ghost or yeah. something, which was fake, yeah. obviously. But it also added up to that and, and made me think, oh, wait, is this actually something? I don't know. Is it a horror game? But after you start listening to the audio logs, that's when you start realizing it's, oh, okay, it's a bit more grounded and realistic. Uh, so uh, nothing's going to jump out at me. <laughs> but no game exists in a vacuum, does it? Every, every game has a context. And no. the people who are playing uh, Gone Home would have been familiar with like Resident Evil and right. Gone Home is kind of Resident mm. Evil but without any zombies in it uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's that kind of uh, environment that so people think okay I'm playing a game this is the kind of things I expect and I think that's one of the reasons why Gone Home is so, so successful was that it confounded yeah. a lot of those expectations and uh, yeah of the players. and I guess uh, the other thing is I'm not I don't even remember playing game uh spoiler alert that um, the theme of it was about love just mm-hmm. plain just plain that mostly it was because of that right that was the theme I'm like wait I haven't played uh, usually those kind of like themes are shown in maybe like a side quest or just uh, like very casually explored through like side mission that kind of thing it's not the main story of the main game that's not the point of it but that's the, that's what this game was about and that was really impressive and I thought that, uh, it was really good that it exists uh, existed then because it i'm pretty sure a lot of other developers was inspired after after our game definitely and, and i think is it, i don't think it would have been as, as popular if, if it wore its theme on its sleeve yeah exactly i don't yeah. think people go oh it's a story about love uh, boring Show, mm. get me some zombies to shoot that because <laughs> yeah, vid- when when normally when video games uh, uh treat with love they're thinking about some sort of horrible twisted love or or shattered love, or unrequited love, or love that has suffered some tragedy. I mean, if you look at Silent Hill games, for example, Mm -hmm. you've got storylines which are about really damaged people and uh, terrible tragic events. You could argue they're about love, but they're certainly not the kind of love that you see in Gone Home. No. A little bit of more toxic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, yeah you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, to be honest, Silent Hill is one of my favorite like franchises. So I can understand. Yeah, because you play it, it's a horror game, but at the same time, it has underlying themes, and those that's why you stay. That's why you play the game in the end. I think at least for me, it's, in, it's interesting that you know a, a very incredibly first person, pretty linear game. I mean kicked you off and then like some of the major games that you've worked on are like 
<laughs> massively like open yeah, world games. Yeah, completely different. To be honest, I love all sorts of games. So if you told me to work on a horror game, I'll be hell yeah. If you told me to work on a first person, I don't know, supernatural game, I'll be like hell yeah. I, I don't mind the theme of what kind of like game it is. I just like working on games and just working on what I like about them, like game design, level design, that kind of stuff. Yeah, if I had to choose. I'll have to think about it to be honest, but <laughs> yeah, I, I I wasn't born one day. I'm like, yeah, only like first person shooters, and that's only the thing I'm gonna work on. You know, right? I really don't mind. I just love all types of games. But could you say, like, for example, if you I don't know if mm -hmm. you played Dear Esther, is that an open world game? Oh god, I played it ages ago. I don't game, remember. Right? I would say it's almost more linear than Gone Home in many ways, but because there was there is a a certain amount of branching in the narrative. You don't necessarily have the same experience each time, but yeah, it always has the same end. I believe, yeah. It's a larger location as well, though, as well, right? Yeah. In the US, by comparison to yeah, Gone Yeah, certainly la larger, but not, I would say, more more uh, complex. There's not, there's not as much uh, mm -hmm. in it as in Gone Home. There's a lot more to do in Gone Home. Yeah, it's just like, I'm just wondering, it's like in the US, it's like, as much as you see it is probably more linear than what Gone Home is. If there is a little bit more space to play with in there, like even if it is linear, does it just naturally feel bigger or at least more open-ended, uh, especially if you're com combining branches in there as yeah, well? Yeah, I think you're, you've got something there. I think it's the theme of the Arrester is very much about the kind of uncaring nature of a cruel universe where these terrible things happen, mm -hmm. whereas Gone Home is a is a deliberately more uh, like human scale uh, enclosed experience yeah. where you explore the, the capacity for love and, and so on. What has your involvement in big open world games kind of been? For example in Red Dead Redemption 2 which is what I have been involved with the most I worked on multiple kind of open world content and mission creation so if you played that game um, things like random events around the world or hideouts or train robberies that kind of stuff and it was mostly about apart from creating the individual side missions if you want to call them like that it was also about for example with hideouts this is more more of a combat design situation and a little bit of level design where you have to you know where do you place the ai your covers yeah your cover points how are where can you uh, enter from and that I think resembles the most level design aspect of RDR2. Is there any mission you're particularly proud of? I don't know, I think all of them. All my children. Because you know they're they're all so different and they're very small uh, because you know they're the kind of thing that you will you're, you're riding in the world with your beautiful horsey and then you encounter something and you play it it can last literally 30 seconds and it took you you know two years to work on it. <laughs> it, wow. it lasts 30 Easy. seconds yeah and then you move on and afterwards you encounter something else and that only lasts like 10 seconds and those are the things like because they're so short it, i can't really choose like what's the best one i think they all can, like had different challenges and they were all kind of perfect in their own way quite hard to pinpoint you know I've still got to get past the beginning of Red Dead Redemption, but it's just really hard in some games when you know that they're going to be massive, you know that your life is going to be now lost to these games. Your life is going to be this game. And so I have to apologize to all the, the hundreds of people that have worked on it. I've had some other friends that have worked <laughs> on it. And I'm sorry, guys, I will play it. I will get you to it. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working on a dead end job? Very different. I think a lot of differences from a lot of perspectives. For example, a very uh, I worked with a large team before, and also had to work with, you know, people in San Diego, for example, because of Rockstar yeah, San Diego. Yeah. So when it came to that, the communications were different. Like uh, I used with um, and workshop, everything was a lot more straightforward. We knew what we wanted. It was delivered, so the team was obviously way smaller. But it also, I think, gave me a lot more freedom to create th things without many restrictions. So, for example, if I worked, I, I scripted a lot of the enemies and created a lot of the enemies for Dead End Job. And we knew the general idea, hey, this is the enemy and we might want to, like, want him to attack, like, 
this way but at the same time i was able to like how much damage i play uh, how is that enemy going to approach the player what animations when are they gonna play um and maybe i could add my own like sound effects or, or like uh, like camera effects uh, camera shake and all of that i would just add it and kind of more I had more freedom to like do all those things because you know if you work at a AAA company everything's a bit more restricted you can't just randomly go add stuff in a big game like that that just because you want to play with them or like just see how it works out you have to let your lead knowing the lead might go to the producer and the producer might go to that guy uh, to the next guy and by the time the work comes down two months later you're like oh wait what this content is crap now so, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. so it's yep. like it's a lot more freedom with that kind of sense you just play a bit more with what you're creating yeah. rather than just focusing um exactly on what needs to be done i think there's like with like what you're saying it's getting that you get a more like experimental approach to your design or anything that you're doing at a lower level because you don't have to request all this stuff before you can actually finally try it in game yeah and i feel also i had more freedom to just um help out in the project with just a few bits here and there that you know normally i would just have to ask hey can i um work on this and yeah. you know you don't i didn't feel like i needed that permission per se mm -hmm. like in a very stressful way that i would in a triple a company yeah i think at smaller studios you can definitely very easily turn your hand to offer help like elsewhere or get involved in another area which might not be necessarily under your discipline but it's something you might be able to do or have input on and it's i think it's easier to have that conversation at a smaller studio than it is at a bigger one because there's less like hierarchy and less chains of yeah. communication to go through i think what i've learned from uh, rockstar is so i honed specific skills in depth more whereas uh and workshop i feel like i've expanded my skills and but not as in depth but i've learned more and like in a different scope if you know what i mean i think this happens in, in a number of companies i mean in life right if you know if you're in a smaller company and you got to wear all the hats yeah you learn so much stuff, you know, from invoicing to <laughs> laboratory cleaning to actually doing your job, right? Sorry, yeah, I was trying to keep yeah. it like, you know, in dead end job because dead end job is about a, a janitor, yeah? Um, yeah? No, not exactly. Isn't it? It's more kind of pest controller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pest control, yeah, yeah that's right. it. But th this goes for for other companies. I've been in companies that you're going like, so who looks after the 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 servers, for example? I'm just making this up, but and you go like, oh well, depends which ones. And you're like, okay, what do you mean which ones? Well, the blue <laughs> ones are handled by this guy. The green ones are handled by that guy, uh, and they're very specific jobs. But if you're interested in a lot of game making, a lot of variety maybe working for smaller companies is a way to not find your niche but if finding like all the yeah, different things sure. that you like yeah doing. definitely i mean that's like i started a smaller company and did the many hats thing first uh i was always fascinated by design but it wasn't up until last year where i finally stepped into a full-time level design role but that took years to get there but like i enjoyed the learning process like you're going through now like having that ability to expand your horizons a little bit because you get to try lots of different elements and like you said before in a triple a company you are very focused you will refine that very specific skill set um, but when you're just starting out you might not have found that thing you want mm -hmm. to dedicate yourself to so like sometimes yeah. starting out small try all these different elements and you will learn a hell a hell of a lot in a very short space of time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Absolutely, that reminds yeah. me of something you said earlier mark uh, you looking at gone home and thinking well you know i i feel like i could join this this kind of this new era of game making and i was just wondering about the different things that happened to fall into place at that time that made so many people think this is what I could do, because obviously the, the the Gone Home team, Fulbright team, they all worked on Bioshock, and that that you know they they left Irrational. Then they thought, you know, well, what what can we do? So they 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 became those people who wore many hats and did lots of things. And I think also, I would say that perhaps the tech also had an impact there, because you mm. are at the point there where you've got Unity and Unreal both becoming more generalist in focus it, and the mm -hmm. tools yeah. really really suddenly improved mm -hmm. whereas before the only chance really 
that you had to make an interesting experience was was hampered by having to work on an existing engine because it was mainly Quake mods or Half-Life mods that people were yeah. Yeah. using as a mm-hmm. vehicle to make their game. Because mm-hmm. Diarestra, of course, was a Half-Life mod, and it was only later that it wow, was okay. yeah that it was um, redone as a sort of standalone product. So you you've got a team of people who want to try something new. You've got tools coming in that mean that they can do it from scratch and not have any of that sort of baggage of legacy systems and closed source that means you're limited in what you could do. They could do exactly what they want and they had the expertise and ability to do it. It's such an, uh, a really interesting time in, in game development. Don't you think because of that, I'm not going to call it a switchover, but a, a kind of just a, a change in, or in the availability of tools, do you think there's different approaches now to level design? Because if you came from a mod, modding background, you're doing like multiplayer maps, You are your level design is very much geared at at like multi, either multiplayer well very much multiplayer and certain combat styles and then it's combat styles like is it you know it's like half-life um trying mm. to think of some other maps like uh, csgo for example right everything that's working in the source engine and then you had like well here you go hot you know unreal engine for example or it's now here there you go you can build whatever you like or mm-hmm. you know unity as well you can build 2d 3d go for it we're not telling you the mechanics to use so you've got a whole range of people coming into it no i I think you're right yeah a lot of people i think who were making quake and unreal and uh, other levels and doom levels back in the day went into the industry so you can see if you look back at the old quake maps and things a lot of people went into the industry and worked at all sorts of different companies and then that kind of hump of people that went through it's almost like a demographic shift in the population this hump of people, they worked there for five, ten mm. years, and then they thought, oh, I've had enough of this. Yep. I'm going to come out again. And then they sort of launch themselves at these at these tools. Yeah, I think that makes an excellent point, because if you think about it, yeah, this is saying that, you know, hey, the tool doesn't, you can make things without this specific tool. It's all about you and your creativity and et cetera, et cetera. But we haven't seen a lot of different games until those tools were given to us by Unreal and Unity. And I think realistically and uh, kind of unfortunately, we need also the tools to help us make some of the games we're making. And that's why we can see such a big variety of games now because it, if you give someone, if you tell someone, hey, there's a 2D engine for you to make 2D games, you'd be like, okay, I can try making a 2D game now. Before, maybe I could have also done it, but you coming and telling me I can do it way easier now, I'm going to give that a shot. And that kind of evolves at one point in like Unity coming over and, and creating a whole UI system that is so easy to use. Everybody's just, you can make things like the Orwell games and I don't know, this is the police kind of games. I'm not sure if that was with Unity, but example, you can make that so much easier than 10 years ago where you had yeah. to program every pixel to like show a button on the screen. Now it's just drag and drop, there's a button. Now I can yeah, do everything right. with that button. It, it helped a lot, I think, create a variety of games. And that's that, that was amazing. Yeah. Like Game Maker Studio, for example, like you're saying, there's some amazing games that came out that yeah. were made in Game Maker Studio. It's just, you know, mm-hmm. got Spelunky and Gunpoint and places, things like that. Just a real, real sort of uh, who's who of uh, indie games uh, of, you know, sort of... Yeah. 2008 2015 i started out in uh, game salad i think the problem for me was that that was i could make games that i didn't play so like it, it was right. like to make the games i didn't really play day to day so it was a bit like well okay and then i found unity and yeah. Unreal. Yeah. actually the first game that i made uh, it was because i played gone home i was like i want to create something similar and um just just because i just like yeah uh, <laughs> i love that it did that i didn't yeah. even know i had to, i i didn't even know how to do any of that and um i just li- literally downloaded unity i barely had any experience with it and i followed a ton of tutorials on youtube and thankfully unity has a lot of documentation online which is really helpful so i actually made a, a house where you zoom in with the mouse, you interact with objects that have text when you hover over them. Um, there's some sort of story hidden on the text themselves. And it just has some triggers here and there that, you know, have some small events happening. And it took me like three months. And I, I did a small copy of that with Unity without knowing anything. So Unity was really basically, 
if it wasn't for that engine, I don't think I would be making games today, to be that's honest. That's marvellous. I'm really, really glad that that's yeah. happened to so many people. Yeah. I, I think it's like w when we start seeing these tools come out, and like you said, Rob, they, they start to get better and better and more refined. The barrier to entry just dropped drastically for everyone. And it's like, it's kind of like if you have an idea, you can probably yourself with the resources, all the tutorials and materials that are out there now, get a functioning version of it like very quickly. It might not be the prettiest thing in the world, but like I think it'll, for a lot of people, they just need to see it work. And whereas now the barrier to seeing that happening, you don't have to get a mod tool where you're confined by all the limitations of this is what you have to use. With Unity and Unreal, you get a blank canvas. You get to choose what goes in there, what the level is, what the character controller is, what the art style is, what the lights are like. And you can go as deep or like mm -hmm. not even go as deep as you want to with all those systems. And you could end up with something like a very simple point and click game or anything like that as mm. well i think that raised uh, competition a lot too for oh, yeah. entry jobs <laughs> because imagine yeah. now if you're going to hire someone you want someone to have in their portfolio some sort of game they made it doesn't have to be big just something you you know you yeah. want them to and you expect them to and it's like kind of crazy that it's, we reached that point yeah, it's, are you completely right it's, it's really raised the standard of the quality of in a good way it's raised the standard of the quality of candidates that are coming into studios so the mm -hmm. people that I've interviewed recently over the last five years, I'd say, are far more competent and far more clued up about what games are and how to make them. That uh, I look back to what we, you know, back in the early 2000s, where it was, it was very, very slim. Not many people knew anything. And the only avenues into game development were, or design really, were, was really a Quake level design or Quake engine level design. And I, I would say that there's there was a really nasty gap, I'd say, where you had the end of Quake 2, Quake 3, and Half-Life. And then suddenly a load of games came out that had, were really closed in their systems, so you couldn't make levels for them. And there was a really nasty gap of no no proper engines like Game Maker or Unity or anything like that had really taken off. And so there was a real problem in the industry. And it's only recently that there's been this sort of explosion this sort of singularity of game making tools that allow people to really create some incredibly uh, imaginative experiences both in terms of the art and the gameplay and if you look on itch or anything like that the the the, sort of the, the quality and the the mad variety of gameplay that you see in there is just really staggering well one thing that those games uh, those game engines also bring in is the ability for people to understand where they want to fit in because you can actually just say hey you know like if you'd asked me before how you would like write a first person shooter right i would have thought it was like all the maths that went into doom right how do you do the levels how do you do the first person rendering how do you do uh, all of that and then and that's what i think people thought game design is and and to a level it is but you know now you go like no 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 i designed the levels around them or i designed the textures on the wall yeah i had no I... idea what a game designer was i thought it was programming at first that you just program like i don't want to program all day every day <laughs> but you, i mean you could do that you you know this like technical designer which helps with scripting and whatnot but you're not like you're not a programmer like in the clear sense of, you know uh so yeah, it's I very think, different I... I think it's a misconception that like it's not it's not as big as what it used to be now but like a lot of people just hear the word game design immediately think it's game developer okay you're going to code forever um and i i think it's just in an industry like years ago we had a problem kind of communicating what the designer was uh because i don't think we necessarily singled out all these job roles to have so many like different things so everyone just assumed if you wanted to make games you had to be able to code yeah, either uh, code really or be an artist or both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whereas now we have like sub disciplines within design and within code and within art, and then even in some cases you've got sub divisions within them, which is kind of insane when you think about. You go back like five, maybe ten years. It was code or a bit of art, and like that was kind of your only way in. I think it's it's true and yet it's not i think there was there was a lot of people doing designs not so long ago you know like by that i mean is you know the, i'm sure when they're making doom the the 
and I don't know the whole <laughs> team. I don't know the whole history, so I apologize if people are shouting at me. There's going to be the people that made like the clay maquettes of all, all the monsters, right? You know, so you had to have creative sides of it. Like, I'm not saying design wasn't done. It just it wasn't seen as necessarily a full job role there. It would be the mm. programmer was doing the design or the artist is doing the design. It wasn't you were getting hired as a designer. Right. It, it was done by the team. It's just, it would have been done by another discipline. I, well. I still vividly remember when Id hired Graham Devine as their first game designer. And that was Quake 3 Arena time. So that was, you know, their fourth, fifth, sixth project that they that they did. And it was like, oh, we're going to hire a game designer. And we were like, oh, a game designer. Wow, oh my God, I can't believe game designer. Uh, and whereas before then, it's like, yeah, you, you might have some level designers, but you, you know, you, the, the whole team would be the design kind of thing, really. And the co- the coder, if they didn't like the design, they're just like, well, I'm not making that. I make my own design. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the co- the coder had all the power. It's like, yeah, yeah, no, that's not happening. I don't want to do the math for that, so that's not happening. <laughs> I think there's also the other problem now that, uh, okay, if you're not a programmer, then are you the ideas guy? <laughs> if you're a game designer, yeah, yeah just that, you just yeah, sit you're there right. and just oh, make up stuff yeah, and yeah. everybody else makes it yeah. and you're just doing it. Yeah, that, that breed, yeah. you're completely right, that breed of designer is almost completely gone, really, except for the kind of the strand of work that a creative director has to do sometimes, which is kind of along those lines. But I would say that the the days of the, the designer who sits there and just types out, Word documents, document that thousand document, page word yeah. documents, yeah. and expects the team to read them. Yeah. I'd say that those days are almost completely gone, and all designers nowadays are expected to implement what they design. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important because when I first started out, I was thinking, oh no, is it just gonna be like documentation, just writing documentation? Cool. Who likes to no, read that? No one. Really don't. I got <laughs> it. Gone. Exactly. So yeah. Uh, so is it? Uh, is it like that in a lot of studios, do you think? Yeah. Is game design meant to be documentation for a lot of... It used to be like that in, in game studios, yes. You would get game designers who would just write stuff. I think with the tools we have these days, and just it's just so much easier to... Let's just prototype something quickly oh, for the yeah. next one hour rather than writing a document for the next one Absolutely. hour. And then you can actually play it instead of... you know. So. I mean, yeah, because you can prototype the stuff very, very quickly. And... We, we, I mean, talking about the tools, not just not just like Unreal Engine or stuff like that. We've got stuff like SketchUp. We've got stuff like you yeah. know, I'm, I was going to say PowerPoint, but probably it's going to be like a Google uh, presentation, right? You're going to. You... I actually made a game in PowerPoint. So. Oh, did you? Yeah, <laughs> it was. It wasn't. So it was kind of like this Hunger Games kind of thing, and you had to select the character at the beginning, which had specific traits, and and then dep- there was like a question and a path, and depending on what you clicked, it would take you to another slide. So you could basically, you know, add a hyperlink to the picture, the text you selected, and it would take you to the proper slide. And they were all connected, and it was like a super branching like game, like a Hunger Games thing. Oh, what would happen if you like, you know, there's a snake here, and it's this type of snake. What do you want to do now? And it would just like you were the point was to survive throughout the whole PowerPoint slide without failing. And that was actually one of the funniest games I made. And that was actually not even um, meant to be for a game like in like it wasn't a project for a specific game for my master's degree or anything. It was I was studying education and we had to present a biology, something in biology anyway, class. And I thought, hey, I'll make a game out of it. <laughs> that's how much I like games. It, it like. I started making them from even though I was not meant to. Well, I mean that that's a, a, a perfect way to get into the industry, isn't it? Let you realize <laughs> what your actual calling is. Is like, yeah. <laughs> Here's my portfolio. I just made a PowerPoint presentation. Game. <laughs> but, hire me. <laughs> well, you, you laugh, but like the first multimedia stuff that I did was started out with HyperCard, and I'm trying to remember the name of this other product we used that I never saw it again. But it was kind of like PowerPoint that you could create a slide that could you could link it to something else and to another slide, right? And then, or play a video. It was kind of like dumb PowerPoint. And that's how you did like this interactive games or presentations, games. I mean, whatever, however you call it. But that's amazing. I, like PowerPoint games. And I, I want to play it now. <laughs> it's, it's in Greek, though. You, you won't get it. Uh, Google Translate. <laughs> I have to translate it. Yeah. Oh, God. No. <laughs> Although I have seen some other ways of. Um, I don't know if we can call them games, but back then YouTube uh, introduced links. Uh, you could annotate a thing. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you could click on it and it would take you to... So they. I've seen some people create like little games where you could, hey, what's the choice you want to make now? And you clicked on the annotation and it took you to the um, video one instead of video two. And then you continue it and branch like that. Oh, wow. I'm not sure if that counts like a game, but that's yeah, cool. It's like make your own adventure stuff. <laughs> yeah, kind of. That's pretty cool. I, I would still... I don't know if that counts, but I think if someone put that on their portfolio, it would be funny. And I would be like, yeah, yeah that guy, that. that person is like finding different ways to make games and that's creative. So why oh, not? Definitely. Yeah. I love to see that kind of thing on a, on a portfolio when it comes in. Yeah, really, really, always really, uh, really gratifying to see. And on that note, I think we've covered everything. I mean, we have to end on PowerPoint. There is <laughs> no higher than we can go than this. So this is amazing. <laughs> Wow. It's the best game engine. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, G- no. Game engine of 2020 <laughs> is PowerPoint. PowerPoints and YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fantastic. I mean, if, you, if someone wants to create a branching story with just dialogue and characters, they can just use that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's fine with that's me. Completely true. That's I, uh, and on that note, thank you very much, Valentina. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. <laughs> Thank you very much. If people can want to get hold of you, I presume they can shout at you on Twitter. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Um, uh, your address is at Valentina and C H R Y S. Because there's the, all the characters <laughs> that you can have in, in Twitter. Um, more like I don't remember why I made that actually. I don't think I, I wanted to write the whole surname. It will have been too big, too confusing, and too ugly to look in a tweet. So. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I've been at Mark Drew. You know where to get me. It's the same as my name at Twitter. And, well, yeah, we'll put all the links in the description. Thank you very much. And Thank you. good night. Good night. Bye. The Level Design Podcast has been a Command Studio production. Our editor is Matthew Lever, and this episode has been produced by Bridie Rose. <laughs>